Hi everybody, I know I promised I would tell you what it takes to solve the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. But then I remember that almost one of two physicists believes that the problem does not exist to begin with. So I figured I should first make sure everyone, even the physicists, understand why the measurement problem has remained unsolved despite a century of effort. This also means that if you watch this video to the end, you will understand what half of physicists do not understand. That about half of physicists do not understand the measurement problem is not just anecdotal evidence, that's poll results from 2016. Please check the information below the video for the reference. This questionnaire was sent to a little more than 1,200 physicists, from which about 12% responded. That's a decent response rate for a survey, but note that the sample may not be representative for the global community. While the questionnaire was sent to physicists of all research areas, 44% of them were Danish. With those warnings ahead, a stunning 17% of the survey respondents said the measurement problem is a pseudo-problem. Even worse, 29% erroneously think it has been solved by decoherence. So this is what I want to explain today. What is decoherence and what does it have to do with quantum measurements? For this video, I will assume that you know the bra cat notation for wave functions. If you do not know it, please watch my earlier video. In quantum mechanics, we describe a system by a wave function that is a vector and can be expanded in a basis, which is a set of vectors of length 1. The wave function is usually denoted with the Greek letter psi. I will just label the basis vectors with numbers. A key feature of quantum mechanics is that the coefficients in the expansion of the wave function, for which I use the letter a, can be complex numbers. Technically, there can be infinitely many basis vectors, but that's a complication we will not have to deal with here. We will just look at the simplest possible case, that of two basis vectors. It is common to use basis vectors which describe possible measurement outcomes, and we will do the same. So 1 and 2 stand for two values of an observable that you could measure. The example that physicists typically have in mind for this are two different spin values of a particle, say plus 1 and minus 1. But the basis vectors could also describe something else that you measure, for example two different energy levels of an atom, or two different sides of a detector, or what have you. Once you have expanded the wave function in a basis belonging to the measurement outcomes, then the square of the coefficients for a basis vector gives you the probability of getting the measurement outcome. This is Born's rule. So if a coefficient was 1 over square root 2, then the square is 1 half, which means a 50% probability of finding this measurement outcome. Since the probabilities have to add up to 100%, this means the absolute squares of the coefficients have to add up to 1. With these two basis vectors, you can describe a superposition, which is a sum with factors in front of them. For more about superpositions, please watch my earlier video. The weird thing about quantum mechanics now is that if you have a state that is in a superposition of possible measurement outcomes, say spin plus one and spin minus one, you never measure that superposition. You only measure either one or the other. As example, let us use a superposition that is with equal probability in one of the possible measurement outcomes. Then the factor for each basis vector has to be the square root of one half. But this is quantum mechanics, so let us not forget that the coefficients are complex numbers. To take this into account, we will put in another factor here, which is a complex number with absolute value equal to one. We can write any such complex number as e to the i times theta, where theta is a real number. The reason for doing this is that such a complex number does not change anything about the probability of getting one of the two measurement outcomes. See, if we ask what is the probability of finding this superposition in state 2, then this would be 1 over square root of 2 times e to the i theta times the complex conjugate, which is 1 over square root 2 times e to the minus i theta, and that comes out to be one half, regardless of what theta is. 
This theta is also called the phase of the wave function because you can decompose the complex number into a sine and a cosine and then it appears in the argument where a phase normally appears for an oscillation. There isn't anything oscillating here though because there's no time dependence. You could put another such complex number in front of the other coefficient but this does not change anything about the following. Okay, so now we have this superposition that we never measure. The idea of decoherence is now to take into account that the superposition is not the only thing in our system. We prepare a state at some initial time and then it travels to the detector. A detector is basically a device that amplifies a signal. A little quantum particle comes in one end and a number comes out the other end. This necessarily means that the superposition which we want to measure interacts with many other particles both along the way to the detector and in the detector. This is what you want to describe with decoherence. The easiest way to describe these constant little bumps that the superposition has to endure is that each bump changes the phase of the state, so the theta, by a tiny little bit. To see what effect this has if you do a great many of these little bumps, we first have to calculate the density matrix of the wave function. It will become clear later why. As I explained in my previous video, the density matrix, usually denoted with the Greek letter rho, is the cat bra product of the wave function with itself. For the simple case of our superposition, the density matrix looks like this. It has 1 over 2 in each entry because of all the square roots of 2 and the off-diagonal elements also have this complex factor with the phase. The idea of decoherence is then to say that each time the particle bumps into some other particle this phase randomly changes and what you actually measure is the average over all those random changes. So understanding decoherence comes down to averaging this complex number. To see what goes on, it helps to draw the complex plane. Here is the complex plane. Now, every number with an absolute value of 1 lies on a circle of radius 1 around 0. On this circle, you therefore find all the numbers of the form e to the i times theta, with theta a real number. If you turn theta from 0 to 2 pi, you go once around the circle. That's Euler's formula, basically. The whole magic of decoherence is now in the following insight. If you randomly select points on this circle and average over them, then the average will not lie on the circle. Instead, it will converge to the middle of the circle, which is at zero. So if you average over all the random kicks, you get zero. The easiest way to see this is to think of the random points as little masses and the average as the center of mass. Now let us look at the density matrix again. We just learned that if you average over the random kicks, then these off-diagonal entries go to zero. Nothing happens with the diagonal entries. That's decoherence. The reason this is called decoherence is that the random changes to the face destroy the ability of the state to make an interference pattern with itself. If you randomly shift around the face of a wave, you don't get any pattern. A state that has a well-defined phase and can interfere with itself is called coherent. But the terminology is not the interesting bit. The interesting bit is what has happened with the density matrix. I know this looks utterly unremarkable. It's just a matrix with 1 over 2s on the diagonal. But what's interesting about it is that there is no wave function that will give you this density matrix. To see this, look again at the density matrix for an arbitrary wave function in two dimensions. Now take for example this off-diagonal entry. If this entry is zero, then one of these coefficients has to be zero. But then one of the diagonal entries is also zero, which is not what the decohered density matrix looks like. So the matrix that we got after decoherence no longer corresponds to a wave function. That's why we use density matrices in the first place. Every wave function gives you a density matrix, but not every density matrix gives you a wave function. If you want to describe how a system loses coherence, you therefore need to use density matrices. What does this density matrix after decoherence describe? It describes classical probabilities. 
The diagonal entries tell you the probability for each of the possible measurement outcomes, like in quantum mechanics. But all the quantumness of the system that was in the ability of the wave function to interfere with itself have gone away with the off-diagonal entries. So decoherence converts quantum probabilities to classical probabilities. It therefore explains why we never observe any strange quantum behavior in everyday life. It's because this quantum behavior goes away very quickly with all the many interactions that every particle constantly has, whether or not you measure them. Decoherence gives you the right classical probabilities. But it does not tell you what happens with the system itself. To see this, keep in mind that the density matrix in general does not describe a collection of particles or a sequence of measurements. It might well just describe one single particle. And after you have measured the particle, it is with probability 1, either in one state or in the other. But this would correspond to a density matrix, which has one diagonal entry that is 1 and all other entries 0. The state after measurement is not in a 50-50 probability state, that's just not a thing. So decoherence does not actually tell you what happens with the system itself when you measure it. It merely gives you probabilities for what you observe. This is why decoherence only partially solves the measurement problem. It tells you why we do not normally observe quantum effects for large objects. It does not tell you, however, how it happens that a particle ends up in one, and only one, possible measurement outcome. The best way to understand a new subject is to actively engage with it. And as much as I love doing these videos, this is something you have to do for yourself. A great place to start engaging with quantum mechanics on your own is Brilliant, who have been sponsoring this video. Brilliant offers interactive courses on a large variety of topics in science and mathematics. To make sense of what I just told you about density matrices, for example, have a look at their courses on linear algebra, probabilities, and on quantum objects. To support this channel and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org Sabine and sign up for free. The first 200 people who go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching. See you next week.